It has been a chaotic and tragic end to America's longest war. Coalition forces brought more than 123,000 civilians out of Afghanistan in recent weeks. This sudden takeover of the country brings back so many of the nightmares. They've been told to wait at home until there's a nationwide policy. Millions of girls across this country are waiting to hear from them. There's been a systematic exclusion of a woman from a social and education sphere. People of Afghanistan deserve to live in peace and liberty and freedom and dignity. We need your solidarity. Welcome to the inaugural Global Women's Summit. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm Jennifer Griffin, Chief National Security Correspondent for Fox News, and our panel taking on the Taliban. I can't tell you how excited I am to speak with these two extraordinary Afghan women. Nahid Farid uh, is a parliamentarian in exile. She left Herat with her three children a week before Kabul fall, fell on August 15th, 2021. She spent 12 years in Herat serving as the youngest ever elected lawmaker uh, to parliament. And uh, you lived under the Taliban in the 90s, from 1995 to 2001. And Yalda Hakim an award-winning journalist, foreign correspondent with BBC News. She has traveled back to Afghanistan three times since Kabul fell. She has my undying admiration for that. You were born in Afghanistan and fled with your family after the Soviet invasion. For me, I, Afghanistan has been near and dear to my heart because I spent my honeymoon in Kabul in 1994 when the world had forgotten about Afghanistan. Uh, my husband was a journalist, and we can't see that happen again because seven years later, we had, as we know, 9-11. So with that, I'd like to start and ask you both, where were you on August 15, 2001? Tell me about the decision to leave Afghanistan, how hard that must have been, and what you saw, what you thought as you saw those images, Nahid. Uh, sure, thank you so much uh, for having me, and it's my honor and pleasure to uh, be at this panel. Um, you know, it is important to look to the issue of women of Afghanistan at this panel, this discussion, uh, from a global perspective, from an international overview, because what happened in Afghanistan can happen everywhere in the world. A group of insurgents uh, can use violence and overthrow a democratically elected government overnight and erase the the hard won gains of half of the society just in a matter of hours. And I think this is important. This discussion is very, very important for women all over the world. Um, I cannot explain uh, how hard it was for me to leave uh, my city, the city I represent, um, the city who voted me, the, my constituency who counted on me. And I still feel so guilty about the abandons, but I had this two unwanted, unsolicited choices of staying in fear or leaving everything behind. And when I say leaving everything behind, I mean everything, personally and professionally. And it has, I think, different, uh, this story has different dimensions. Um, not knowing ever I will return back. Or another dimension was that I experienced the same stories that my mom told me when she was also um, escaping the same city from the same path to the same destination of Iran when uh, there was a Soviet occupation and she had to leave. And you know, she was holding me and I was holding the hand of my daughter. And we resisted this cycle of conflict on our own way. My mom raised me, I came back to Afghanistan. I continued to become the, the um, uh, advocate and become the member of parliament. And I believe my daughter will definitely go back and fight for the freedom of that nation. But I think this story has to have a happy ending, not a cycle of conflict that victimized women. And I think, um, I think basically, um, my daughter should 
and definitely should go back to a country that is prosper, is free, uh, is full of dignity, coexistence, love, peace, liberty. And that's why we are here to make that happen. And Yalda, you were that daughter. You were born in Afghanistan to parents and they decided to leave during the Soviet invasion. You know what it's like to leave your country, but yet you've committed yourself to going back and telling the stories of Afghanistan. What was it like on your last trip? What has it been like since Kabul fell to the Taliban? And how has it changed over those three trips? Well, um, Jennifer, I think uh, when I went back in November of last year to mark 100 days of the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan, it was clear that they were a group that hadn't organized themselves. They weren't North Korea. They weren't Iran. They were still trying to figure out what was going to happen next. And I continually heard from people in Afghanistan that just wait and watch. There is going to be a major crackdown on our basic human rights. So when I went back again in July to mark almost a year um, since the fall of Kabul, what I saw was the systematic erosion of the rights of not just the human rights of the people of Afghanistan, the 38 million people in that country, but the targeting of women and girls. They have been pushed out of the public eye. Women like Nahid do not exist in the public space anymore. And I found that absolutely shattering to see that a country that had made so much progress over the last 20 years, it wasn't perfect. And you'll attest to that, Nahid. You, you could go to corners of, of the country where things were still very bad, whether the Taliban were in power or not for Afghan women and girls, but they went to school, they got an education, they had the ability to dream. And now we have 422 days since the Taliban banned girls from going to school. And when I sit across the Taliban in an interview, in a room, I say to them, you waged a war, an insurgency for 20 years. Was it to take on 12-year-old girls? Was the war against 12-year-old girls? Because right now, it feels like your war is against a child that you're banning from school. Your war is against the women who are taking their children to public parks. This week, the Taliban banned women from going to public parks. They banned them from going to gyms. They banned them for having a reason to step out of their homes. They want a reason. Why are you here without a male guardian? Why have you stepped out of your home? What is the reason for leaving? What is the reason for going to the airport and wanting to leave the country? So what I find difficult as the daughter of Afghanistan is that Will we be able to see a future where there will be more Nahids and daughters of Nahid being able to be educated in that country to have hope? And what do the Taliban tell you when you ask those questions? They say what we want to hear. We are working on putting a curriculum together. We are working on putting a uniform together. Well, it doesn't take 422 days to put a uniform together. It doesn't take 422 days to segregate classrooms that were already segregated before the Taliban came to power. The, the, uh, uh, the uh, sort of curriculum at the school was already based on an Islamic curriculum. They, the uniform was already based on an Islamic uniform. So it's incredibly frustrating that they have now sharpened their sort of PR machine and they say the right things to Western media. But the situation is ex incredibly different on the ground. And it's the only country in the world, I think it's important to remember, where girls' education is banned. Now, the Washington Post has done some incredible reporting on secret schools, and these are where many teenage girls are now participating, educating themselves behind closed walls. What would happen, Nahid, if the Taliban finds them out? Um, OK, so actually, um, any authoritarian regime, including Taliban, whether it is Taliban, Putin, Ayatollahs in Iran, whether it is CCP against Uyghurs in China, they are all built on patriarchy. They're all built on misogyny. They all exercise this as a, as a mean to suppress women because me, women are a threat to them, a threat to, um, to exercise their authority and 
use the control and power. And I think that's why women should not get educated when an educated woman definitely will transform a society uh, that will demand the rights of a, a nation. And I think if they find out, they definitely will, um, will crack down on those schools. And these are all the stories Yelda John also highlighted. Uh, and, and we are talking about um, 700,000 jobs that will be male dominated just in a matter of few years because according to UNDP before the fall of Afghanistan with the Taliban, uh, women with the same level of education had the same working capacity in, in Afghanistan. And this was not easy to come into, into that level in a male dominant society like Afghanistan. But just think about uneducated women who cannot compete in workforce. They will be kicked out of the workforce and when we have no woman working and, and, and keeping themselves into the society uh, economically, they will definitely have no right to continue uh, their, their cause publicly. Yalda, what message did you hear from the young girls that you interviewed? What should the, the international community and the US be doing right now based on your reporting? Well, Jennifer, the United States was engaged in Afghanistan for 20 years. There are women in this room who put programs together to assist those Afghan girls and give them reason to have hope. They, these women and girls were told, join us, be part of Project Afghanistan. We will fund you, we'll support you, we'll back you, we'll, we'll um, bring you to the West and give you scholarships so that you can better your country. And in the end, we'll abandon you. This is what Afghan girls are saying to us. And to me, when I go there, they say to me, is anyone listening in the outside world and do they care? I went into one uh, woman's home in Herat, which, which is where Nahid John's originally from, and she pulled out a box full of certificates that she had received from programs here in the United States, across Europe, invited to you know, parliaments across the Western world and told you can do this program, you can do that program, you can then take it back to your own country to assist the women in your country. All of these women and girls are now sitting at home wondering if anyone cares. And as Nahi John said, no one has a monopoly on human rights, women's rights, democracy. These are not Western concepts. Afghan women and girls are staring down the barrel of a gun today, demanding their rights. And I think what's different about this time with the Taliban coming back is this is a generation that's on social media. It's the TikTok generation. The, they're connected through social media and so what is different about this time with regards to the Taliban regime? Yeah, um, this time is different for, for the movement of women of Afghanistan and also for the Taliban that they also use social media against women and they all manipulating the international community with their, uh, their promises that they don't keep, that we, they will give amnesty to all, they will start an uh, inclusive government, they will uh, start um, giving permission to women to continue work and education. But, you know, um, there are, there are um, resistance from women. From women of Afghanistan um, have a very different resistance from women of Iran, although it is really um, admiring from my side as a women right defender, the movement of women, life, freedom in Iran, and we continue to support that. Um, we, we want a free Iran next uh, to Afghanistan. Uh, at the same time, women of Afghanistan um, are fighting publicly in the streets, are fighting domestically at homes because they are also facing a male dominant society and family that really don't care about the right of women. They're also fighting economically. We have literally women who sell their kidneys so their children don't go hungry. Come on. So women of Afghanistan are fighting in a different situation in multi-dimension fronts, fighting, resisting, and oh my God, they're, they are, they're women of resistance, they are women of power and strength, and we are so proud of them. And Yalda, what impact are the Iranian women's protests having on the women of Afghanistan and vice versa? What message from Afghanistan to Iran? Um, Jennifer, I, I recently on my show um, had 
an Iranian protester in Tehran speak directly to an Afghan female protester in Kabul. And they spoke to each other. And it was so moving to listen to their fight, their struggle, the fact that they inspire one another, the fact that, as you say, this is the TikTok generation. I call the young Afghan uh, girls and women in Afghanistan the quintessential 9-11 generation that, that were full of, of you know, a, a brighter future for themselves. So they're going to continue to fight for their cause in both of these countries. It's whether we're listening and prepared to, to, to talk about it, to discuss it, to hear them. And to help them. Yes. Um, the Washington Post, Nahid, has also done some great reporting on how the Taliban is training women in a segregated manner. So they're training lawyers and doctors, but they're not going to let them uh, be integrated in any way. Is this going to work? Is this advisable as opposed to not educating women? What do you think? What do you make of this? I think if you look to this um, uh, from just uh, a glance, uh, it might look positive, but gender segregation in the long run will definitely impact women. Why not training women who want to become politicians? who want to become engineers, who want to become um, um, computer science. Uh, they, want, they want to have the freedom of choosing their, their uh, topics to study. And I think this is something that gender segregation will lead the country and women of the country towards more limitation, towards more um, inequality. And I don't support that person. Could universities be, here in the US be providing online education to these girls and women? And are they doing so? They are doing, um, Yelda John and myself, we are involved in different uh, universities, USC, mm -hmm. Princeton, um, Penn State Global uh, Compass. They all are working on how to provide this online education for girls who cannot travel. but they have the hope to continue this education. And when I talk to those women back in Afghanistan, they say we don't look to this screen as just a screen. This is a window of hope. And we look and we are waiting for the time of the class to get us started. Is it time to set up a government in exile? Are the women parliamentarians I know are a virtual government in exile, but should there be a formal government in exile that's recognized by the West? I think. Um, it's time to let the Taliban know that they are not representing the diversity, the civilization, the democracy, the talents of the people of Afghanistan. And I think any time that anyone says, what is the alternative to the Taliban? I would say, people, give the people the freedom of choice and they won't choose Taliban. Because we know what kind of phenomena we are facing in the Taliban, a group that is committing atrocities and forced displacement and public execution and um, women crackdown. And you know, we are facing the world's uh, most serious human, human rights crisis in Afghanistan. And we're already seeing ISIS and other Al Qaeda and other groups starting to go back to Afghanistan. We're almost out of time, so I want to just ask you both. Will you go back to Afghanistan, Yalda? Well, I, I continue to, to go back because I think it's so important when I see the bravery of these women, uh, like I said, protesting in the streets, knowing that they're taking their own lives into their hands. I met one woman, and I'll, I'll be very brief, who took her five-year-old, her seven-year-old, and her 12-year-old to a demonstration. And she said, I, I put on the cloth of death, a white cloth on them, and explained to my children that we may not come back home. We may not survive this. And this is what the women in that country are currently These are facing. brave, brave women. Will you return to Afghanistan? Before I ask, answer that question, I think it's important that we ask international community. They have been so good at solidarity, putting a statement. Um, resolution, women, peace and security agenda, all of them were so important, but they were mostly gestures of symbolism, unfortunately. And, and women of Afghanistan situation have been much more deteriorated. This year, we want them to, um, to commit themselves into uh, putting some substance behind um, this gesture of, of symbolism, whether it is Magnitsky Act, whether it is um, some um, more travel ban, blacklist on the Taliban, but let's put this advocacy into something in action. I will go back in Afghanistan with pleasure. That's my route. That's my country. I want to thank my two guests, Yalda Hakim, Nahid Farid. 
Thank you for being with us. For our audience at home, uh, we're going to take a little break, 20 minutes, um, for some refreshments. And our program will resume with a discussion about mental health with the US Surgeon General. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.